All right. So we're going to do a little interaction. You ready? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I pray all week for this. All right. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to read a slogan, and then you're going to guess the company or the organization that it is. All right. So we're going to start off kind of easy. Are you ready? All right. So the first one is the happiest place on earth. Okay. So there we go. Got that one right. <clears throat> Second one is this. Let your fingers do the walking. Yellow pages. All right. Third one is outwit, outplay, outlast. Survivor. Okay. Not, not ever. How many, how many of you guys know that? You have no idea. Some of you got, already got outwit, outplayed, and outlast. All right. Uh, how about this one? Uh, the fourth one is save money, live better. Walmart? Okay, good, good. And then here's perhaps a tough one. Uh, American birth, uh, 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 does that say American, bir uh, American by birth, rebel by choice? Anybody know? Harley Davidson. Some of you guys out there are writers of it and you don't even know the company's slogan. Shame on you. Go home and sell it and buy a Kawasaki. All right, and then here I put these in just for fun. Uh, these are like the worst slogans. Can you guys see that? Bu budget burial, cheaper and deeper. <laughs> Probably not one you guys will remember the number, all right? Here, here's the next one. <laughs> Night quill, sleep into a nice coma for a few hours. <laughs> you like that one? That's, that's me, all right? And then here, here for you guys in construction, here's a little construction slogan. Maybe. <laughs> Don't use Night quill. Nope. Is it there? It's not there? Huh? It's, it's all, that's all you have? That was the best one. Said something like this. Safety, we've upped our game, now up yours. <laughs> Probably not what they meant. <laughs> I took it. I actually built a business card around that slogan. So, Pastor Dan, we upped our safety. <laughs> Oh, have a little fun. Hey, as we start off and we think about being the message, um, I think oftentimes in our walk and in church life, we kind of want to synthesize down uh, our faith to just kind of a slogan. And the reality is we actually really would rather it just be words because words are easier, right? If we just say a few things, then that means we fulfilled our duty and we fulfilled our, the Great Commission and that's all that matters, and so we'll just reel out a few words and, uh, you know, somehow we're going to satisfy, check the box off that we're living our life for Christ. <clears throat> Look with me in your outline. At the very top of your outline, St. Francis said this. He said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. It's pretty powerful, right? Live your life as if the gospel was dependent upon it. And then every once in a while, maybe you have to explain it to someone because perhaps they don't. They don't get it. In your outline, look at this. <clears throat> what the world sees, and speaking of us as followers of Christ, what the world sees should be consistent with what we say. So our beliefs ought to dictate our actions. What we believe about the gospel, what we believe about the kingdom of God should drive us in how we behave. And again, it's easy to just kind of throw up some words up on a, as a slogan to say, oh, Jesus loves you. I mean, it's easy to do, isn't it? But it's hard, it's easy to say, but hard to do in our life. And that's what this series is. It's really to push us to understand that we are to do more than just say stuff, that we're actually to live it out, and that each of us, and we're going to use this as an illustration in our mind, each of us, we are a billboard for Christ. And in that billboard, there's a unique message that God has written on our heart and through our experiences, our abilities, our personality, and so forth, he has written a message that's unique that he wants to speak in and through us. 
All right. So today, as we kind of begin, I want to lay the foundation. We're going to jump into how God begins to build our billboard. And I want you to turn to John. John is the gospel of John. It is going to be the theme for the whole series. So if you're in a community group, uh, you're going to be uh, encouraged to read a chapter a day. Uh, there's 21 uh, chapters in the, in the gospel of John. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that as the weeks go forward. But look with me in John chapter 1, verse 1, at the starting of it. And here's what it says. It says, um, in the beginning was the Word. That, that word is logos, right? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Logos was with God. And the Word was God. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. All right? Now let's just kind of go back and think about the culture in which John writes to. All right? Look with me in your outline. <clears throat> to the Greek philosophers, the logos, right? The word Christ was impersonal, abstract principle of reason and order in the universe. Okay? So just kind of think about it. As they thought about what John was saying, they realized that there was a creator force. They realized that there was a supreme being. They realized that perhaps there was a source of wisdom. But he wasn't personal. He wasn't somebody that they could relate to. And so as John speaks into the life of these people, he uses the word logos, and he's not talking about kind of some distant foreign thought. He actually is going to bring it down into their world and into their, their, their thinking. And so in verse 2, he says, uh, he was with God in the beginning, okay? And when we read that, we kind of go, well, I don't know. I, I, I get it. You know, God is all, uh, Christ has always existed. He was with God in heaven. Okay, I get all that part. But, but it actually means something bigger than that. It actually means that Christ was face-to-face -face with God in heaven. And so he takes this mindset that they have that, that, that God is impersonal, that there, yeah, there's a supreme being and yeah, there's, a, there, there's a, a, a person who's in charge of order and that kind of stuff, but he created it, he left, he's no longer interested. And John speaks into this culture and he says, listen, the Logos was in the beginning. Christ was in the beginning and Christ was with God, <clears throat> right? And he came, he was face to face with him. Now look in verse 3. Through him all things were made. So as they look at all the world and everything that they are able to see, he says, through him all things are made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Verse 4. In him was life. Now that isn't the word bios, which means physical life. It's the word zoe, which means spiritual life. All right, so he's not talking about the physical life here. He's talking about the spiritual life. He says, in him was Zoe, the spiritual life, and that life was the light of men. Okay, so the spiritual life was the light of men. Verse five, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not understand it. Verse six, <clears throat> there came a man who was sent from God, this is speaking of John, his name was John the, you know, John the Baptist is who he's referring to. Verse seven, he came as a, what does he come as? A witness to testify concerning that light. Which light? The light of men, that which was the Zoe, the spiritual side of Christ, okay? He came to testify, and it goes on, it says, so that through him all men uh, might believe, verse 8, he himself was not to the light, speaking of John, but he came only as a witness to the light. And we'll stop there. All right? So here's what John is saying. As he speaks into this culture that, that, that recognizes that there's a supreme being, that, that there's a source of matter, that they understand that, but it's not personal. It's just this distant God that isn't able to interact. And John says, listen, he came, he came as Logos. He came into the world face to face with God. And all that you see that he created, he sustains. And John is speaking of himself. He says, but I've come to testify of the light and I've come to witness to the light. Now there are two kinds of witnesses that we have. And this is a legal term for witness. 
if you have ever witnessed a, a, a crime or an accident, you've ever been called to court, I've, I've actually had to go and been summoned to court to be a witness of an accident, right? And so the judge asked me, so what did you see? And he has a whiteboard and it's car A, car B, light, intersection, so forth. And this is my experience. This is what I witnessed, okay? Now there's another group of people and they are expert witnesses, and they are people who are going to go testify on the defense or on the prosecution side to give testimony of expert. The DNA says, the blood splatter says, that, that kind of stuff. They are expert witnesses. This witness is just a simply an eyewitness, not an expert witness. He is simply going to witness to the world of who Christ is. Okay? Doesn't mean that he's a theologian. Doesn't mean that he's an expert. It just simply means that he is going to give a witness to what? To the spiritual life that he has experienced, the life that has changed in him. Okay? So John takes a view of, of God as this distant God, brings him and makes him personal in Christ, and then says, My job is simply just to witness to how he has changed my life okay so keep that in mind as we keep keep building this case and then if you skip down to verse 14 and it says this and we're going to look at this verse over the next couple weeks <clears throat> the word became flesh and made his dwelling and that word means to pitch a tent okay so this logos that was distant in their mind <clears throat> he comes he pitches a tent among us we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right? So we are to witness, we are to be a witness of His life, His message, and His love. All of us as believers are simply to be a witness of His, of his life, His message, and His love to the world. Now let's go and take it a step further. In John chapter 14, if you skip down, if you're in the gospel, flip over a few pages. <clears throat> John 14, verse 16 says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Verse 17, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now listen, very powerful part of the verse right here. But you will know him, for he lives, what? With you and will be in you. All right? So, this impersonal God comes and dwells among, among us. All right? As Paul writes, they see Christ. They experience. They hear his teaching. They hear all the things that he's doing. All right? And John says, I'm a witness to that. Now, later on in John chapter 14, we're getting close to the end, right? Where Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, he's getting ready to leave, and he says, listen, I'm going to send the Comforter to you, and the, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he is going to be with you, and he is going to be in you, all right? As believers, we have with us the Holy Spirit, and he is in us as well. John chapter 15, verse uh, 26, when the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Jesus is, uh, Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit is going to testify about Christ. All right, are we tracking okay? Verse 27, and you also, what's the word? Not might, must, right? You must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Okay? Now, let's kind of bring this down. So here is John writing into a culture that says there is a supreme source, there, there, is, there is some sense of order, but, but this creator isn't personal. This creator just kind of flung it and left. And John says, listen, you got to understand, in the beginning was Logos, right? And he takes him through the whole process of Christ 
coming and dwelling amongst the people. Jesus took on the form of a human to make the message clear and to reveal his love to a world that had a difficult time embracing a creator who wasn't personal. Are we tracking? Okay. So the Spirit of God dwells in us and with us. And our job is, as the Spirit of God is in us and with us, the Spirit is going to testify about Christ, and we must testify about Christ. Pause. Not with words. With actions. Why did Christ leave heaven to come to earth to make his message and his love clear to humanity so they could relate to him? He has ascended to heaven. He has placed in us the comforter, and that means the same as in us, the Holy Spirit. Our job is to be the visible body of Christ on this earth. Not with words, with action. Words are cheap, aren't they? When someone's going through something, hey man, God bless you, all the best. It's cheap. Doing something for that person becomes much more difficult, doesn't it? And so we become kind of experts at just throwing out words and slogans and Christianese to a world who, and if you really kind of want to get deep in thought, who look at and how you read statistics of how many people believe in God. The vast majority of people believe in God. But they don't embrace Him as personal. And I just, this is a side thought. This isn't anything, you know, I wonder if the New Testament church, the body of Christ, has abandoned the doing part of the body of Christ. And as a result, the world, just as in John's day, believed that there was a, a creator, but he wasn't a personal one. Because us, the body of Christ, is abandoning the doing of it. And I think if that's the case, here's the reason why. Because we're so afraid that people are going to believe that you work your way to heaven. And so we push back on that. Right? Right? But the reality is when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God dwells within you, our job is to be the body of Christ. And our job is to do the work of Christ, not talk about it. Right? But it's, it, but it's much easier to sit around and talk about it. Look with me in your outline. <clears throat> Jesus' life message is the gospel, and we are the witnesses to that life message today. Jesus is the Word. The Word is the Gospel. Christ the Word lives in you. And we are a billboard, and we're going to be building on that, and we are a billboard of the Gospel of Christ. Not a slogan, but we are a billboard, an advertisement, if you will, of who Christ is and what He has done in and through our lives. And listen, if you can then begin to figure out what that message is that Christ has placed on your billboard, you will begin to be in sync in what God is doing in and through your life. Where we struggle as believers is we just we don't know what that message is. What's it say? And so we just kind of go back to, default back to, hey, Jesus loves you. But you have a unique message that's different, that has the grace, of, uh, the grace of, of God in it, and that you speak it, not in just words, but in actions to others. So how does that work? Look with me in your outline. My life message. My unique message of Christ to the world. So <clears throat> you have a unique message that is different than anyone else, for you to advertise, to take an impersonal God who John says came as Logos, came and dwelt among us, pitched a tent for people to personalize with, 
He ascended to heaven. He placed in you the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And our job is to be a witness of Him. So how do we build that? In your outline. How do I discover my life message and align my life with it? Okay, so not again, not slogans, but here is how God begins to work in and through your life. Let's take a look. Number one. The first one is, is you have to listen for God's whisper. You've got to listen for God's whisper. <laughs> in order to hear a whisper, you have to turn down the noise of everything else, right? And in our world, we have, a no we have, we have lots of noise. Just ambient noise, noise in our head that's constantly going on. And in order to begin to hear that whisper, and this is like those small impressions that you get in your life. These are the things that I say, I, I, I would describe them this way. These are those little heart pricks that God places in you that you can't shake. You know, a desire, or a, 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 a wanting to help a person God lays a person on your light in your mind and you just can't seem to shake it and it's like I need to call so and so and you don't call so and so and the next day you wake up you're like I need to call so and so those are those little whispers that God places in our life all right and here's an interesting situation in the old testament there was a prophet Elijah who clearly needed to hear from God he was in a place where he was discouraged and he wanted to hear from God. And in, in 1 Kings, it lays it out. I'm not going to read it all. But God says to him, he says, go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord. Okay? And then there are three things that take place in his life. And each time he says, and God wasn't in that, and God wasn't in that, and God wasn't in that. And the first thing, he sends a windstorm in. And it just blows the place apart. And the scripture says, and God wasn't in that. And then he sends an earthquake and it shakes the mountains and the rocks begin to slide and the scripture says, and God wasn't in that. And then there's this huge fire and unfortunately we know a lot about fires around here and in different parts of, uh, of California and there's this fire that spreads and the Bible says, and God wasn't in that. And look at the very last part of that sentence and verse. It says, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. See, we oftentimes think that God speaks and the loud, boom, crashes and booms. And sometimes He does. But if we're not willing to kind of turn it down and we're not willing to really pay attention to those whispers, then we're going to miss out on part of that message that God wants us to share and who He begins to burden us for. And so we're looking for the big, you know, write it in the sky, God, and God oftentimes is going to work in that gentle whisper that you can't shake. You can't shake. One, one time a pastor was, I was struggling with the God's calling into the ministry, and, and he said this, and I think it was one of the wisest things that he ever, told, he ever said to me. He said, Dan, if you can do anything else other than be a pastor, be a pastor. And he says, but that still small voice that you're, spirit, you're, you're experiencing, if you can shake it, shake it. But if you can't, it's of God. It's that little whisper that you wake up in the morning where God is tugging at your heart, prompting you to do something. you got to pay close attention to that. And not just the loud kaboom type of stuff. And so as God begins to build your billboard, He is going to take those gentle whispers that, that you have in your life. And so part of the challenge for, that we're going to be looking at over the next 21 days is for 21 minutes, for 21 days, we want you to just pause for that 21 minutes, morning, afternoon, night, whatever it is, to listen to that gentle whisper, to hear God. And then part of that 21 minutes is to read one chapter of the Gospel of John. There's 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. So 21 minutes a day, or 21 minutes a day for 21 days and reading one chapter of, uh, of the Gospel of John uh, to recognize and to hear that gentle whisper. Number two, the second thing is to recognize your sacred shout. 
okay, to recognize your sacred shout. C.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. And that's true. And everything in us, everything in us, we want to run from pain, don't we? We don't want to embrace it. And so look with me in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says this. It says, and the word became what? Became flesh, right? Jesus took on the frailty of a human, yet without sin. He didn't have a sin nature. That's the, the, the uh, virgin birth, right? He took on the frailty of a human so that we could relate to him. Now, you've got to grab a hold of this, all right? If we run from our weakness and we run from our pain and we run from our failures, that is the greatest tool to engage a hurting world is our own weakness, our own pain, our own failures. That God has done this in and through my life. I was this way and the Spirit of God has worked in my life and because of it, I'm this way. And if we run from our failures and we run from our, our, our messes in life, that is the greatest tool that we're running from. That is the light to the world. And we run from it because for whatever reason, we don't want to be around it. It's like, I got to get rid of it. I got to get away from it. And so we, we flee from it. In Hebrews, look, look what the Hebrew writer says of Christ. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. So let me just kind of turn it upside down. If as believers of Christ we walk around as perfect, how is that going to relate to a broken world. It isn't going to relate to them. If you walk around and everything's perfect for you and you're not willing to embrace those, the, the weaknesses and the, uh, the things that you've struggled through to use it as part of your message to share, you're fleeing from a huge part of what God desires to do in and through you. In your outline, <clears throat> Don't hide from your pain, your weakness, or your failures and mistakes because so many times it is the mess that God takes that turns into your life message. And yet we want to flee from it. And yet Christ took on the form of a human. Well, why? Because John says, because they didn't believe it was a personal God. They just thought it was like this God of abstract God up there and he takes on the form of a human and he comes and he dwells among us and the Hebrew writer says, listen, we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. He's without sin, but he can sympathize with the struggles that we have. And if we embrace our weakness and we're more willing to share our weakness with other people, you will make connections with people. And let me just say this. The vast majority of adults who come to Christ come to Christ because of some crisis in their life. The vast majority of adults. There's a marital issue, financial issue, health issue. Somebody dies, something along those lines. And as a result of that, they come to know who Jesus Christ is. And if we as believers flee from that, and we just want to embrace our perfection, although there isn't, then we're going to miss a, a, a huge part of, of, of that message. Luke chapter 5, verse 31, here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered them and he said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? The sick, right? Verse 32, for I have not come to call the righteous, but to sinners to repent. Right? And if we are the body of Christ, then we are going to reach out to the sick. And the best way to reach out to the sick is to be able to share the struggles that you've had, the messes that you've had in your life. If you go out and sharing your perfection, it's going to be hard to connect. It's going to be hard to connect with them. 
So you recognize your sacred shout, the pains that you had in your life. That is part of who you are. The third thing is you embrace the holy disturbance. Okay? You embrace the holy disturbance in your life. Sir Francis says this, Disturb us, O Lord, when, uh, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dream too little, when we arrive safely because we sail too close to the shore. Okay? So we need to be careful of that. Look with me in John, again, John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and blood, and moved in, this is the message translation, and moved in to the neighborhood. And again, that word dwelling or dwell meant to pitch a tent. Okay? So here's John speaking into a group of people who, again, who, who, who doesn't think that God's a personal God. And he says, listen, th- this one who was face to face with God, he came to this earth and he pitched a tent. He, ca- he came into our neighborhood to dwell with us to, to bring a personal touch to his message. He leaves. He ascends to heaven. He tells us that the Spirit of God is going to be with us and in us. And the Spirit of God is going to testify of Christ. And we are obligated to be the body of Christ, to be the invisible God. We are to bring visibility to Him. Not with the words but with flesh and blood. God could have easily just spoke from the heavens, right? Did in the Old Testament. But He came in a way of a human, Christ, to have that connection with us. And so as we, as we share Christ, it's not just a verbal thing. It's an action thing. All right, It's about the actions in which we do. All right. Now here's the struggle that we have when it comes to doing things for Christ. You read the newspaper, the internet, you listen to the radio, there is tons of problems. Would you agree with that? There's millions of people who live on a couple bucks a day. There's, there's millions of people who do not have clean water. There are millions of people who, well, I mean, just look at what's taking place in, in, uh, in the Middle East right now who are fleeing their war zones. I mean, it, it's overwhelming. And as a result of it being overwhelming, guess what we do? We do nothing. Because if we can't minister or reach or touch or dig enough wells for everyone, we just won't do any of them. And so we get so overwhelmed with it, we just decide not to do anything. In your outline, you can do more than nothing. Right? You can do more than nothing in your life. Here's what I did. This is just one example. About 18 years ago, obviously in the ministry, there was an article that was written about divorce. It was running rampant. It's affecting churches. It was a problem for, for both believers and unbelievers. And it was, a, it was a big deal. The article had written, this guy had written, come up with a thesis, that if couples went through 13 weeks of counseling, the rate of their marriage surviving was significantly higher. Okay? Now, as a pastor, you're thinking 13 weeks. That's a lot of time to invest in families or couples who want to get married. All right? But I, I felt like it was my duty to support. I couldn't save all the marriages. I couldn't affect all the marriages that was taking place. But I could affect the ones that were coming in front of me. And so I committed to doing a 13-week class for the couples. No charge. I was going to invest in them and help them through premarital counseling. And ultimately, we made it a part of the church's bylaws that if you get married here or you get married by one of the pastors, you've got to go through 13 weeks of counseling. Right? Now from just, and I'm not complaining about this, I actually enjoy doing it, but from an investment standpoint, I don't need another thing to do to be honest with you, when I do that with a couple, it means that I have to work 
you know, that many more hours some other time or some other place, right? But it's the one thing that I can do to help marriages. I can't save them all. I can't touch them all. But I can do something for the ones that come in front of me, right? And so we can look at the culture and look at the world and we can be overwhelmed with it. You aren't going to touch everyone. But you can do something and you could do more than nothing. And how do you determine that? That gentle whisper? That burden that you have in your soul? The pains that you've gone through in your life? The messes you've gone through in your life? And you can begin to see how God is guiding you and directing you in your life. The majority of ministries that are started come out of someone's broken life. Okay? And so you need to make sure that we're paying attention to that as, as we're moving forward. You can do more than nothing. And then the last thing is this. You can love the one in front of you. You may not be able to go overseas as the team's doing here on Saturday. You may, you may not be able to go out of state. But there are going to be people in your life that God places in front of you. And you need to make sure that you do more than nothing in their life. That you invest in them. And that you make a difference for them. You read about children and how many don't have dads. You read about how the kids are going off the hook and they're crazy and disrespectful and doing things that, you know, for me growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, we'd have never done that. And I was a punk kid. But some of the things the kids, I, we would never do that. Are you willing to invest in their life? And the reality is, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, and every Sunday, they're here. Are you willing to invest in their life? You have a burden for marriages? You have a burden for parenting? Are you willing to invest in it? You can't save them all, but you can save some. And every week, we have families who show up here. I don't know if you noticed that. Are you willing to invest in them? Are you willing to do something? See, it's easy to speak words, isn't it? It's difficult to become a doer of the word. And as we sit here today, folks, I mean, this is the real challenge that we have as, as the body of Christ. We need to be the visible body of Christ and we need to be willing to take that step to invest in, to support, to encourage, to be a part of the work of Christ. Otherwise, we're just simply going to have slogans. We're going to talk about statistics. We're going to shake our head and discuss. And we're going to leave here, get in our car, and we're going to come back. And guess what we're going to do next week? Same thing. We're going to sit around and say, I can't believe it. Do you know how many? Do you know this? Do you know that? And in, in, real, in, in the meantime, we're not doing what he has called us to do. Let me wrap this thing up. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what Paul writes. <clears throat> he says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, now I want you to get, kind of get a hold of this. <clears throat> the invisible God that John was wrestling with, with Romans chapter 1 speaks about, has to be brought to be visible for the world to see. And we are God's workmanship to bring an invisible God to be visible to a world around us. And you are His workmanship. That cross and the silhouette of the human represents, the cross represents Christ. And you are to carry the image of Christ into a hurting world. Not in words, but in action. The Spirit of God is with you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. 
to do what? To testify about Christ. The light of men. The Zoe. The Spirit. And we are to carry that into the world so that they will see an invisible God as the body of Christ begins to be a visible part of the invisible God. And so as John speaks, it's an invisible God. And he says, listen, the Word is going to become flesh and He's going to dwell amongst you guys. You're going to see Him. You're going to hear Him. And then Jesus says, as He ascends, He says, I'm going to send the Spirit to you. He's going to be in you and He's going to be with you. He's going to testify about me. Not as an expert witness, not as a theologian, but as somebody who has been touched by my Spirit. And then we are to, as the body of Christ, we are then to go out and bring the invisible God visible to a world. How? With our actions. Because if we're going to love our neighbor as ourself, it's going to take more than words, isn't it? If we're going to say that children without a father matters to us, then we better be willing to do something about it. If we're going to say that the students are jacked up and crazy in our culture, then we better be willing to step in and invest into their lives. If we think marriage is important and we think rearing our children is important, then we need to get involved and we need to be a part of that in their life. If we think addiction is, a tri- is, is bad, then we need to be willing to do something about it. Not just simply talk about it, but put it into action. So in your program, aren't you glad you came today? What about that fluffy sermon, Dan? Just make me feel good. As a total side note, as our culture, I don't know if you're aware of this, is spinning out of control, there is a hunger for something that is going to bring stability to a very unsettled culture. And I think that the church has a huge opportunity to become the body of Christ like the Scriptures teach to bring stability. Because the world has played with from the early 60s with God's not interested in us. I'm going to go do my own thing. You know, the crazy chaotic life that they lived. And now they're recognizing that's not working so well, is it? And I think the church has an incredible opportunity to reach out. And to say, listen, we're all a little screwed up, but we know a good bolt to be a part of, Jesus. And if your life is a little screwy, as Billy Graham used to say, I know I'm screwed up, I just know what bolt I'm screwed to. <laughs> I think that's true. Inside your, inside your program is the blue card. Let me, let me challenge you. This isn't about making you feel guilty. This is a challenge to you to really pray about. I want you to think through and pray through some of the areas of service. If you sit back and think, hey, what a greater opportunity we have to invest in preschoolers to build a foundation to begin to bring stability to a culture. Every Sunday, they're back there. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, the youth are here. Junior high on Wednesday, senior high on Tuesday. Invest in them. In the back, on Sunday and on Wednesday, if you're going to change the culture, folks, you change the culture through our children. And that's the whole emphasis of why we have a big emphasis in our children's area. Is if we're going to change the culture, it's going to happen in our children. Invest in them. There's a new one in here, Community Impact. And I I would like to, I'm not looking for a bunch of uh, workers now, but if you are, consider yourself a leader, I think that it would be great to have a, a, a community impact leadership team that would investigate some needs in our community and be able to, a few times a year, bring those needs to us and then as a body of Christ, go out and take care of them 
And if you're interested, I don't want a bunch of we could do this, we could do that. I need people who are going to organize and plan and do some investigation and all that stuff. If you're interested in that, then check the box. And when we have our meeting, we'll get you together. If marriage, and this isn't on here, this is something God placed on my heart yesterday. Hey, if you, if you recognize marriages are in trouble and you want to help and be a part of a team that would encourage marriages, just write marriage on the bottom. So just because we don't offer the ministry here doesn't mean that we can't. Maybe you're the agent to bring it in. Right? It's pretty quiet here. <laughs> right? But you have that burden in your soul that God has placed in there. And he probably has given you a bunch of train wreck experiences that you would love to share with people so you say, hey, don't jump on that rail. That rail's not a good place to go. And you have a lot to bring to the table to encourage folks. And don't miss that. Don't miss that that, that sacred shout and then just the burden that God has placed on your heart. So please, pray through this stuff. I, I want this series to be not just a cool series of going through, but really a launching pad of our church in, in the way of ministries to be the body of Christ in our community. And it, folks, it isn't going to happen through the pastors. Our job is to equip you. Your job is to do the work of the ministry. You got that? So we're not looking for more things for Pastor Dan to do. All right? We're looking for things that you're burdened for to go do.